Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I'm a huge fan of today's guest. He's been on the show before. He's been a speaker at my live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference, and I think he actually is or was Dr. Esselstyn's boss at the Cleveland Clinic, where he is the emeritus chief wellness officer. He's been on TV so many times. He's written so many best-selling books, and he has a new one out today called The Great Brain reboot where he's going to teach us that we can actually crack the longevity code. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Michael Roizen. Congratulations on another fabulous book. Great. Oh, AJ, here's the book. So it is the Great Age Reboot. And on September 13th, actually, if you go to our website, greatagereboot.com, there's an extra surprise. But the Great Age Reboot um, is uh, probably the most important. You know, I've had four number one New York Times bestsellers. Um, and yes, I was. I did recruit Dr. Esselstyn to the Wellness Institute, the clinic, and was his boss. Um, and uh, he and I have, have a good, the, we, we go out on his birthday or anniversary, one or the other, every year, um, and uh, argue about salmon and olive oil. But other than that, we agree on almost everything. <laughs> I love it. I love it. He speaks so highly of you. I, I think I think you, you guys are both precious. So what, what, what drove you to write this book? And can we really live longer? Well, you're going to be able to live younger longer. So what drove me and, and what, what drives any time you write a book, it's got to be new science. Really, in other words, I don't, if, if all I'm doing is rehashing what I've done before, it's no fun for me and it isn't important enough to write a book about or spend the time. But this is, um, I play, I'll give you the story behind the book. I play ping pong with a guy named Albert Ratner. Um, Albert was CEO and chair of the board of Four City Enterprises. It's a big um, real estate firm that got sold in 2018, I believe. But he, um, would always try, he's 18 years older than I am, and he always wants 18 points, which in a ping pong game of 21 is a little overwhelming, um, especially because he went to um, college um, at Case Western, then Michigan State, on a basketball scholarship. So he's really quite a coordinated person. And in way of psyching me out or trash talking me before the ping pong matches every Saturday, he would say, what's happening in Madison? And I would tell him about the 14 areas since about 2014, 14 areas of um, what we call exponential research gain in aging mechanisms. That is not how do you slow aging, but how do you reverse it? And there are 14 areas that now have been shown in at least two animal species to reverse your rate of aging. And now they're moving into human trials. So we, what has happened, I would tell him that. And he'd say, you know, if that's going to occur, then we're going to change the amount of housing we have. I mean, he's an expert. He redeveloped Stapleton Airport. He did Barclays Place or the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Um, they, they've done uh, a huge number of buildings worldwide and homes worldwide. And he said, you know, if you're going to live 30 years longer, you're going to work 15 or 20 years longer, meaning you're going to stay in your home. So we're going to end up with a real need for and a real boom in the economy. In addition, he brought in an economist um, as we went on this, it got serious. And he said, let's write a book about this. And he brought in an economist from Wharton, Peter Linneman, who's uh, now emeritus at Wharton, but um, who said, you know, if this happens, the worry about the trust funds, Medicare trust funds, Social Security trust fund going bankrupt won't be there. So the book has three parts. One is, first, it is the 14 areas of this incredible scientific progress, such as what's happening in therapeutic plasma exchange and what's happening in uh, stem cells without immunogenicity, et cetera. Secondly, that was the first third. The second third is on the economic and political and um, personal implications from an economic standpoint and a living standpoint and a policy standpoint 
of what's likely to happen so that people can prepare for it. And the third is what you can do medically and, if you will, economically to prepare for it. Because if you're going to live to 110, it, essentially, we've expanded life expectancy two and a half years every 10 years since 1890. So we've gone from a life expectancy of 41 to about 79. We're going to go up to 110. That's conservative in the next 10 years, a 30 year jump in 10 years. That's going to be an emotional change and a huge change for society. And so what we wrote the book was to help people plan for it. Wow. So who are these people that are living longer? Because, you know, when I look around, Dr. Royce, and people are getting heavier all the time. Most people I know are overweight or obese. So who are these people that actually are living longer? Because the people that I seem to encounter are not healthy. Well, it's not there yet. Remember, these are just moving into human trials. But one of them that's occurring actually real near where you live now, near Davis, um, was one of the three places this has been in. Um, is the transformation of white fat to brown fat, what we call induced tissue regeneration. So imagine if you take your white fat, that's stuff that hangs off you, that causes inflammation, it in, increases osteoarthritis, it increases type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, memory loss, dementia, everything bad, right? But now take that white fat and regress it to what we call pluripotent fat and turn it into brown fat. Brown fat is what you have when you're a youngster that keeps you warm when your mother can't swaddle you. And so taking white fat and turning it into brown fat, done in three animal species, one of which is amazing to me. At Crimson, they at Clemson, sorry, they did this in sheep. And why do they do it in sheep? Well, sheep die of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They refuse to stop eating. So if you've got a sheep herd and you want to get wool from them, you have to keep their you have to keep them on a diet, so to speak. But at Clemson, they regressed their white fat into brown fat, and they cured their non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, eliminated obesity in the sheep. So this is really um, potentially within three to five years in humans, we'll be able to eliminate obesity, um, and which is Truly amazing wait, if wait, this wait, works. Wait, wait a minute. No, come on. We, we're going to be able to eliminate it without any effort on our part? You mean it's... Well, we don't know that there's not going to be an effort. We don't know how available it will be. Some of these things are expensive. Some of them very inexpensive. So therapeutic plasma exchange, donating a unit of blood, you actually get paid for it right now. And that changes brain functioning in the AMBAR studies. So in fact, in a 2A, 3B study, I, you can see I'm, I, I get passionate about these 14 areas, but 2A, 3B study that already has FDA approval on that one, and a second 3B study is now undergoing way so that the FDA has said that if this works, they will give this a approval for treatment of early dementia. It reversed, it, it donating a unit of blood every week for five weeks, and then once a month for four months in people with early dementia, reversed all 12 aspects of cognitive dysfunction that were examined in the AMBAR, A-M-B-A-R, you can Google AMBAR studies. Multi-center study, done uh, two centers in Spain, two in Chile, um, two in you know, US, uh, Pittsburgh and Cleveland reversed every one of the 12 dimensions of cognitive function in people with early dementia. So over 15 months. So it wasn't that it slowed the rate, it actually reversed the rate. So these are um, rapidly progressing fields. Now to get to obesity, that that's really inexpensive. We pay people for plasma donation now. But in fact, the we don't know but in animal models, three animal models, rats, guinea pigs, and now sheep, they've been able to take white fat with three inexpensive drugs using what is called the Yamanaka genetic factors. There are four factors and they only use three of them to regress the white fat into pluripotent fat and that 
with one other inexpensive already approved generic drug, turn it into brown fat and eliminate obesity in sheep. Now, will this be 100% human? We don't know. There are 14 shots on goal, but if any of these shots on goal works, we're going to get to be 40 at calendar age 90. We said in 1998, that's how real age started, that 60 would be the new 40. That's come to pass in the nurses' health study and the health professional study. We now think 90 is going to be able to be the new 40. So AJ, you got 40 more years at least of doing this. Sheesh. I mean, but it sounds like the, at some point we won't have to even take responsibility for our habits. We'll no, be no, 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 no. It's not. So we think at some time in the future, maybe 2050, 2060, whatever it is, you go in at one end of the car wash and you come out a younger person at the other end, right? This is like but, mind blowing. This is like a science but, fiction. I can't but, like. But for the foreseeable future, it's going to be one organ at a time. You'll notice I spoke about um, brain aging in one and obesity in another. And believe it or not, they've taken 17, this is George Church at Harvard in a offshoot company of Harvard MIT has taken uh, 17 year old male beagles and regressed them to three year old puppies. Oh my God, because this is my, I don't even care how long I live. I want Bailey to live longer. So if you can do something to have her live longer, that would be well, amazing. Well, you got You can contact George Church. You should have him on your podcast. I, I would love to. I would love to. That's that is amazing. But, I, you're just blowing my mind because you know one of the viewers is saying, you know, what good is living longer if you're not healthy? So we'll you're be healthy. It's it's a totally different understanding of what aging is, right? Yeah. You're going to function. Take that person who's eighty and regress them to forty. You're going to get to be able to be functioning in a much healthier fashion. So it's not like a hundred of today is a hundred of tomorrow. It's a hundred of, to, of tomorrow will be like maybe 50 of today. So you're going to get to be a lot younger, uh, longer. I mean, that's the amazing thing. What that also means is that the trust funds, Social Security and Medicare, which are supposed to run out of money in the 2030s and were, you know, the government's worried about it because there aren't enough babies being born, not enough young people. Well, if you live, if you live 30 years longer, you're going to work probably 20 years longer. So you're not going to want to retire at 65 if you're going to live to 115 and have 50 years of retirement. You're going to go crazy in that. So you're going to find a second and a third career. Our educational institutions will have to change. We've got a, a section on that, what we think will happen. But what happens is you're going to be paying into Social Security and Medicare for a long, longer, which is going to make them solvent. But let me go another thing. If you take, and this is a law in Australia, Singapore, and Denmark, and I'll tell you a secret at the end because it's a real surprise. If you look at those three countries, they force you to save 3% of your income in a non-government retirement fund that they guarantee will increase 4% on average per year. Well, if you take 3% of a $15 per income, $15 per hour income at age 22 and last to 65 and keep doing it, you'll end up with about $250,000 in today's income. But if you don't touch it to 95 because you're working, you'll end up with $1.4 million in today's income. And compounding has an enormous benefit, just like it does in health. And if you have someone who matches it, that is uh, someone who uh, you have an employer who matches your income, you'll end up with $2.8 million. So if we do it right, like Australia, Singapore, and Denmark have, you do away with a lot of wealth inequality. And guess what? In May, the House of Representatives in a hugely bipartisan fashion, something like 440 to 12 or something, passed it as a rule for the United States. It's at the Senate now, it hasn't been voted on, but no one even knows about it. It was one of the few bipartisan things that's been really done in a huge way. So this may occur. Our policymakers may have us do it right by mistake or intention, whatever it is. But in fact, 
this changes it compounding changes finances if we do it right and that's what a lot of the middle third of the book is about how to do it right for yourself and for society and i can't take credit for that that's peter linneman and albert ratner you know they're if you look on it there are two other authors other than me um and they're much more brilliant than uh, i ever thought of being it almost sounds like a twilight zone episode too good to be true and people are wondering will this be for everyone or something only the very wealthy can afford no as i said there will be something we we don't know what it's going to cost but the economic benefits are huge um so in if if it ends up being therapeutic plasma exchange it's very inexpensive to do that if you had to do stem cells and this is one of the great advances that mike west had mike west is a uh, longevity researcher one of the areas is the yamanaka factors yamanaka got the nobel prize for it but mike west patented it the same year so it's weird if you will but mike west has developed stem cells without immunogenicity well, if we were to take your stem cells, which stem cells are the matriarchs of the human body and they repair everything in addition to we derive from it. But if you took stem cells, say you had a, God forbid, a heart attack and you took stem cells to repair it, it would cost an awful lot. If your stem cells had to be taken from your bone marrow, put in culture, grown for three months and then given back to you, that's very expensive. But if we can take your stem cells or my stem cells, take away their immunogenicity, take away their reaction that will let someone else reject them, if when grow them in culture, you need 20 to 30 million of them for any repair. At least that's the animal extrapolation. But we can do that now very inexpensively because we take away, Mike West's invention was to take away their immunogenicity. So you can now grow billions, trillions of stem cells in culture that anyone can receive. So we don't have to do it individually. That's a huge breakthrough in stem cells. Normally when you get stem cells like injected into a knee at one of the clinics, it's 7,000, 8,000 maybe. This is, but that doesn't do any good. The, the growth factors will be what happens, helps in your knee. And it takes away pain and it may help, um, but it usually doesn't regrow cartilage. But imagine we could regrow cartilage because we can give you 20 to 30 million stem cells that you're not going to reject because of an immune reaction. Everything changes and it becomes much less expensive. So the, the point of, of the 14 areas are, um, some of them will be expensive, like the one on induced tissue regeneration of white fat to brown fat. Right now that's very expensive because they got to do it to your fat rather than growing it in culture or doing it mass produced. But there will be people who figure out how to do it in a mass produced way. Will the planet be able to support all these people living longer? You know, the, the great thing, and you're near the center of this um, in the vegan world, um, just imagine we had um, yeast that could grow beer. That's what happens, right? Yeast are what produce beer in bioreactors. Do you know the size of a city needed to produce all the world's food if we did all the food in bioreactors? It would be about the size of half of Los Angeles could produce all of the world's food in bioreactors. What's the key? Well, we now know how to genetic engineer yeast. So yeast, if you will, to get beer have to be grown and have to be cultured and you take the one beer group and you put them in the next bioreactor and the next and the next, it's the same yeast. But imagine you want to grow wheat or you want to grow chocolate. It's a genetic engineer into that yeast and you can grow all of the world's chocolate in a factory the size of your house. So you can grow more chocolate than is made in the entire world with just water, yeast, and a little sun and you got it. And so that's the amazing thing. We're going to be able to, um, if, if the, the spinoff of the Human Genome Project and of all of these 14 areas, including gene editing, is that we're going to be able to produce literally all the world's food in a size of a city, half 
of the size of Los Angeles and have leftovers. Um, that's the amazing thing. So that's, you know, I'm not, that's coming. That's already in progress. The center of that is actually Northern California where they're doing the most research on it. Um, so you're in the, in the center of it. Um, and just like we uh, use bioreactors to make all our beer, um, you can put all those bioreactors for enough beer for the world um, in probably a, blo a square block. Um, you can do the you can do the same thing with chocolate too, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> While we're waiting for all this technology to advance to the point that everyone can afford it, are there things that us mere mortals can do to live yeah, not just longer but better? That's the last third of the book. So one of the things we learned when the Human Genome Project started in 1992 and three, both Craig Venter's group, the private group, and Collins's group, the NIH group, thought we'd find someplace between 250 and 350,000 genes based on the amount of DNA in our nuclei. What they found was we had between 21,000 and 24,000. It's now 22,500 they've settled on. What they call the rest of the DNA, the majority, they called it junk DNA. But eight years later, the ENCODE project found it was actually epigenes, which are switches that control our genes. So the key point is you are a genetic engineer whether you know it or not, and better than any engineer for you, whether they went to MIT or Caltech. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. If you just jump rope for two minutes at a high enough intensity, you turn on a gene in your muscles that produces a small protein called a risen. A risen gets across the blood brain barrier and turns on another gene called brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor that is like miracle grow for your brain and grows your hippocampus. So the best treatment or the best prevention for dementia, for cognitive dysfunction, is adding speed to your workout or intensity in weightlifting so you turn on the gene that makes arisen. Are we going to get a risen as a protein we give each other? Well, I don't know because uh, UC, University of California and Harvard both patented or tried to or submitted patents the same day for it, much like they did with CRISPR Cas9. So there'll be a fight over who owns it. But you own it because all you have to do right now is do a little more intense exercise for your muscles. Another thing that came out of Northern California is speed of processing games. So how do you keep your brain young? And that's the, the most vulnerable organ in the body. How do you keep your brain young? It's not only speed of processing and eating vegan as you're doing, um, which is brilliant for your brain, but in addition, it is doing speed of processing games. That is games that make you think fast and do double and do decisions. Out of California, out of UC San Francisco, it's double decision and uh, freeze frame that have been shown now in three randomized controlled trials to decrease the rate of development of dementia by over 30% if you just do 18 hours of practice over 10 years. That's 1.8 hours a year on average. Um, but you know another way is blueberries. Another way is I'll talk to Dr. Esselstyn about this olive oil. Another way is coffee. Maybe, but um, if I eat oil, I get fat. That is a fact. I get fat when I eat oil. Then I don't eat it. it. I, I, I'm not saying you don't have to do any, all of these. There are 34 okay. things that have been shown to decrease the risk of dementia. Now, we don't even know how many, but just imagine if gene editing progresses and we can edit out E4 genes and put and replace them with E2 genes, ApoE4 replaced by ApoE2, you, instead of having a threefold increase in dementia risk, will have a 30% uh, reduction in dementia risk just by that change alone. So there are huge changes that have now been shown. That's been done in animal models, and it'll probably be pretty close to being tried in humans because a lot of things are being tried in humans. Now, let me give you another one. This is crazy, right? You want to know a cheap one? 
beta beta metadine, which is a diuretic, and Viagra, which is obviously used for pulmonary hypertension as well as erectile dysfunction, are two drugs that are now undergoing randomized controlled trials for prevention of dementia. Why? Well, at the Gladstone in San Francisco and at the Cleveland Clinic with IBM, which is, we have quantum computing IBM, they analyzed the fourth degree structure of every drug already approved by the FDA that was generic, something like 1,323 to 2,300. And they found a group of drugs, 16, that seemed to antagonize the attachment of amyloid or tau to neurons. And by by doing that, they then went and looked at large databases, San Francisco separately from Cleveland Clinic, but both had databases of about 15 million patients. And it turned out, Cleveland Clinic Group, when you looked at Viagra, it had a 69% reduction in dementia risk for those who were taking it compared to the rest of the group. Epidemiology, now they're going into randomized controlled trials, but that's a 70% reduction from an inexpensive drug. Beta metadine, which is Bumex, it's a diuretic, even less expensive, four dollars a month in the over-the-counter market, if you will, meaning in the in the pharmacy generic market, um, does the same thing. Seventy percent reduction in the UC San Francisco studies out of Gladstone. So imagine that that's what it takes to prevent dementia. Really inexpensive. That's the combination of AI and now randomized controlled trials that are both sponsored by NIH to look at this. So we're in this huge area of, you're going to get to be healthier. It isn't the 100 year old of today where you won't know whether you're having peas or pistachio pudding. It'll be the 100 year old of tomorrow will be like the 40 year old of today. Well, how long do I have to personally wait? I'm in my 60s now. Well, you gotta, we think you gotta make it 10 years before this becomes common. Um, You know, they, what people come to me who are 85 or so and say, um, where should I go for treatment? And it is, yeah, you can volunteer for the experiments now, but we'll know much more whether the AMBAR, whether plasma exchange works, whether hyperbaric oxygen works, whether the stem cells with immunogenicity work, whether, you know, whether mitochondria restoration with urolithin A works. Um, so there are whole bunches of, you know, urolithin A is in walnuts, raspberries, strawberries, and uh, pomegranates. And we don't meta- we don't produce urolithin A unless we have specific bacteria type in our gut. So we don't produce much, but the supplement doesn't need those bacteria in our gut. Um, and uh, with the supplement, it seems to restore it in animal models and now in two human trials. So we're going to restore energy, restore stamina, so that you can have um, much more muscle stamina and not lose muscle as you get older. So there are incredible things. And the great news is many things you can do now, like the intensity of exercise, like the intensity of speed of processing games. Wow. Will, will this also make us look younger? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is there's only one of these study areas has had enough biopsies in while it's been going on for brain aging that show that the skin, the elastin and collagen regrow and make you younger. And that's actually the novel hyperbaric oxygen therapies. Um, Novel, why do I say that? Because instead of staying at, for example, 1.6 atmospheres, um, this is taking you to two atmospheres, down to one, up to two, down to one, up to two, down to one, three times in a a 90 minute period. Why does that work? Well, the um, people who developed this, it initially got developed in uh, Louisiana, New Orleans at their tank for their uh, hyperbaric chamber for divers and is now, Israel, Abu Dhabi, and uh, the villages in Florida are using it in tests. And what it shows is that 
if you go to two atmospheres and then down to one, your body thinks it's the same as going from one atmosphere to 0 0.4 or to low oxygen level. When we're at a low oxygen level, we stimulate stem cell production and repair and shut off growth, which gives you longevity. Um, and what two to one, two to one, two to one, Although your body thinks you're going to a low oxygen level, you're not risking damage the way you would be if you're going to 0.4 atmospheres. So there's no downside in it other than the time that it takes. And you regenerate skin in, in addition to regenerating brain, uh, muscle, and pancreas, which are the other three organs they biopsy. But this is an interesting one for you, AJ. You, you'll understand this. Out of the uh, 90 volunteer, 89 volunteers on, uh, for brain health, only 13 volunteered for the 12 skin biopsies required, and all of those 12 were men. So all we have is male skin gets younger. We don't know whether female skin gets younger, but we expect it does. Oh, boy. I, well, you know, we're going to they're not having the technology so when we're nobody's going to live forever right so what are we going to eventually die from well you're still going to die from accidents you know if you're not careful if you unforced errors um will kill you so uh don't don't text while driving um and don't go uh skiing without a helmet on um so those are um common uh problems but let me tell you um we don't know how many reboots you'll get. And let me go and say that. So in the mouse model, they've used the this Mike West, Shea Yamanaka. Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize for his work. But um, you model in 107 week old mice and regress them to 40 week old mice. That's the equivalent of taking a 104 year old human and making him a 30 or her a 37 year old human. They haven't had a chance to see is it doable a second time. This wasn't one mouse. This was two different mice strains. And it was a group of I think it was 18 mice. So this has been a a consistent that's the Enter, go into the car wash at one end uh, at uh, 90 and come out 40 at the other end um, program. So that's actually um, in process. That's a study that was done by a combination of Italian scientists, Indian scientists, and at UCLA. So California is uh, leading the way. Actually, Google is, as you probably know, this area of research is so intense that Google started a moonshot for it about four years ago called Coleco. For the first three years, it looked like they were going in a different direction, but now they've gone to the Yamanaka factor, induced tissue regeneration, and they've shown they can do it in mice too. That's the fourth group that has used three of the Yamanaka four factors and regressed animals from an old age to a young age in total. Um, how, where, how soon that will be tried in humans, we don't know. Um, and there are rumors that it's being done in Italy now, just the same Italian scientists, Indian scientists and scientists from UCLA are involved in it apparently. But we don't know, what, they haven't reported on results yet. Are there any side effects to this technology? Because it doesn't sound like it's been studied all that much. Well, the side effect when you used all four Yamanaka factors were that in a, the equivalent of two human years, they developed cancers, meaning they had un, unrelenting cell growth. But when they only used three Yamanaka factors instead of the fourth, they cut out what's called c Mike, cutting out c Mike, c m y c gene stimulation got rid of the cancers. So that's what, so people, this was originally developed by Yamanaka in 2004, and it progressed to the point where you could regress animals, but it caused cancer by 2014. 
But now with three species, three of the Yamanaka factors, first done by a private company near Davis and at UC San Diego, then by a group in Switzerland, then by a group at Hopkins, and now by Coleco as well, all of republished it. Um, you apparently can, um, in fact, be able to regress these animals and maybe humans um, without cancer forming. So we don't know of side effects, um, but they have shown uh, now it, it and they're, they're only in the two years since they started this period. So we don't know where it'll go. Oh boy. I, well, obviously people are very interested in living longer. Your book is number one in longevity for new releases. Uh, it's not, it's not out yet. So that's really, right, but, but, but it's still, it is still number one though, pre-release. So it comes out, I'm, I'm holding it again because of pride, if you will, but it comes out uh, September 13th. Right. Yeah, but if, you, can they get the you, Kindle right you, now? You pre-order it. The Kindle's available and the audio book will be available too, I understand. Yeah. Even without all this technology, it seems that life expectancy has increased since, you know, my grandparents were alive. Yeah, it's, it's increased two and a half years every 10 years. Um, and people don't, I mean, you understand that with your grandparents, because when you were born, you're probably, it was a three generation family, right? It was grandparents, parents, and children. And the grandparents usually didn't, you didn't live till your old age to live with your, are your grandparents still alive? No, no neither are my parents. Usually that's that's what normally happens. But imagine us living to 120. You're going to have five generations alive at the same time. You know, children, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents. It's going to really take a a fairly sizable change. The the decrease in life expectancy with COVID-19 is life expectancy at birth. It's a way of calculating life expectancy that assumes that COVID-19 will kill people, that the same diseases which killed people last year will kill them at the same rate every year going forward. In the Spanish flu, life expectancy at birth decreased 12 years the year after it struck. But now, but then two years later, it was back to where it was. We expect to see a rebound as COVID-19 doesn't uh, kill people at any place to the same degree. Um, and um, the new science, the science of aging reversal, already in human trials. So we're seeing that with, for example, sickle cell disease by knocking out the sickle cell hemoglobin, which is now done in 76 people in a trial at Penn. 75 of them are living without the pain of sickle cell or thalassemia. It's really, it, Instead of having a life expectancy of 41 to 45, that group now has a life expectancy of 75. So just a huge change that's already starting to penetrate into human trials. Wow. Do you remember a while back, the Surgeon General said this is the first generation of children that won't outlive their parents? Um, I, th we, I think that that's probably not going to be true. I think it is probably true. I, in other words, this is only with an 80% probability. We have 14 shots on goal. We don't know for translating from animals to humans is not always the same. But remember, I've said we now have early studies on tissue plasma, um, therapeutic plasma exchange. We have early studies on hyperbaric oxygen. We have early studies on stem cells without immunogenicity. We have early studies on the Yamanaka factors in reversing obesity. We have early studies, I mean, all of the, we have a lot of studies now in gene editing and in immunotherapies for cancer. I think it is very likely um, that you're going to outlive your parents by a considerable amount. Um, First of all, you get a lot of choices, AJ, right? You've chose vegan life. So you're probably already outliving uh, some of your parents and grandparents. I've already um, outlived a sibling. 
Yeah, so um, I can tell you, um, Albert Rat. You know, if you look at the author, Albert Ratner is now ninety-four. Um, he, as I said, he's eighteen years older than I am. He wants a point, an extra point per year older in our ping pong games, um, and uh, he 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 beats me fifty percent of the time without any points. Um, but uh, part of that is probably doing the trash talking. So he's he's awful good at, at getting me to uh, not play my best at times. I, I keep thinking, though, playing devil's advocate, that if people know that there's a technology that exists that at a certain point will reverse aging or diseases, they won't take any responsibility for their lifestyle choices today. Well, remember, if I said it's going to be one organ at a time, if you get osteoarthritis, in an artificial knee, it's not as good as the original one. Um, and so, or if you have a heart attack, um, we don't know which of the organs are going to break through and what the steps are in this process. So you, so it's more important than ever to take responsibility for yourself. Um, and that's, you know, um, I'll, I'll I'll say something that's going to be controversial, just so you can have it on the show. And and uh, so when I started working, Mehmet Oz and I started working together in 2004. Four weeks into it, he said, um, I want to be president. And I said, why? And he said, it's the only way I can change health care. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, we've got to get ingrained in humans, in everybody in the United States, that they've got to take responsibility for themselves. We should have, if you will, a system that rewards people for taking responsibility and doesn't reward people um, for not taking responsibility for themselves. And so long ago, he wanted to do this political thing. Um, and uh, I don't know that he wanted to be uh, a Republican, if you will, at that time. But in any case, the, the key point is... Um, we need a government that says we're going to do, we're going to help you to stay healthy by giving you a reward for doing so. We did that at the Cleveland Clinic with our 100 and now 10,000 employees, and we've decreased our costs by 38% without a benefit change, and the employees get about $1,500 a year back if they get to the six normals plus two, six normal biomarkers plus two, normal blood pressure, LDL, cholesterol, et cetera. And what has it done? Well, we just have the data. And so another new breaking thing is it decreased their rate of aging substantially. So not only did we save 38% compared to our competitors, compared to our trend line without a benefit change, but the employees get uh, have gotten a whole bunch of they've gotten over uh, three hundred million dollars in direct payments back, and probably um, at least an equal amount in decreased copays and need for for care. In addition, um, the human capital by decreasing their rate of aging has increased. Um, their disability free time has increased, and by the way, up to two thousand nineteen, we don't can't do data after 2019, but before COVID hit, through 2019, there was a 38% also decrease in, um, if you will, unexpected time off, which is really sick time. Um, so um, the employees got healthier by doing this, by taking responsibility, and saved an awful lot of money in it. Wow. Well, I keep thinking if people really, if that many people are going to live that long, won't it break the bank in terms of social security? I mean, I've been hearing my whole life that, that by the time I'm eligible, it won't be there. Um, well, what will happen is it'll gradually increase in age. And if you're working to, if instead of, if you live 30 years longer, you're going to work 20 years longer, you're going to pay into social security and Medicare longer before you take it back. Um, and so it's actually saves the Social Security and Medicare system. But what about the planet? Are we even going to have a planet to live on? Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about climate change and the heat of the planet. But as I said, the, the, the most of the um, 
as I understand it, most of the heat comes from agricultural production and eating things. And as I said, you can make bioreactors the way they do with beer. They use CO2 up rather than cause it to produce. Well, you can do the same thing with bioreactors that make chocolate or bioreactors that make corn or bioreactors that make wheat. Um, and that's what's going to come. So I am not worried about the food. I don't know um, how fast we'll be able to change um, the, uh, the increase in climate developed heat. Um, but clearly um, the technology in all of these fields is increasing at incredible speeds. And so that's why we say longevity will be the next disruptor. You know, all the other disruptors have made life better for us, energy, fire, um, the uh, wheel, et cetera. And the last one, the chip, 60 years ago, it's made life better for us, but longevity gives us life. And so it's going to be the, uh, it'll be, you know, I, I just hope I get to not have an unforced error before then, because I want to say, I, I'm dying with curiosity to see how we adapt to this. Because if there, you know, Peter Linneman says it best, if there's enough money in the system, and there will be, this will be a huge economic boon by people living longer and producing. If you live, if you, if you grow, live 30 years longer, work 20 more years, you're increasing human capital by 50%, increasing the GDP by that same amount, which is huge. Everyone, just imagine you have 50% more money to spend. Everyone will if we do it right. And the point is that if we have enough resources to spend, we'll eventually do it right, although the politicians will muck around with it for a while. Hmm. Are you familiar with the Blue Zones? I am. Because they seem to be doing at least a lot of things right, because compared to the average population, they seem to have greater longevity. Yeah, no, and um, the the Blue Zone work of Dan Bootner is, is impressive because they come up with uh, the same things that we see with rate of aging and that we see in the larger epidemiology studies they came up with, which is, you know, everyone does physical activity, everyone um, is more or thin, they're basically vegans plus fish. Um, and, no, pro uh, no processed food, no sugar, no, pro I mean, no right, processed food. Right, right, yeah. That's right. I mean, and, uh, you know, if you will, and they have friends and a posse and purpose. So the most important things you can do now are, in fact, manage stress with posse and purpose. Long time ago, Whitehall studies in Great Britain, Alameda County studies and Berkman studies in the U.S. Um, the most important thing is to have six friends you're vulnerable to and a purpose in life. And uh, so... As you can tell, I'm passionate about this and have a purpose, and I know you're passionate about spreading veganism. Um, so uh, the, they're both, we, and we need to both cure, we need to cure uh, the uh, Southern California area of uh, the lack of those uh, right now. Do I understand that you either have or will have an app based on these principles? Um, yeah, I'm not allowed to talk about that till the 13th of September. Okay. So, but yes. Um, so uh, go to the website, greatagereboot.com, and you can find out more. You know, we've written a, a huge number, uh, over 180 um, summaries of all the work on 50 of them are supplements. So should you take oxaloacetate? Should you take melatonin? Should you be taking urolithin A? Should you be taking phosphocreatine, et cetera. Well, there are about uh, 24 of which have been shown out of, the, out of those 50 or so we've analyzed, 24 of which have enough human data to say they're both safe and they help slow the rate of aging or reverse the rate of aging. Um, 20, whatever it is, seven of the 51 we've analyzed now don't have enough data and you shouldn't be spending your money on them or your precious time on them. So the, the point is there's a lot of data that is really helpful 
at greatagereboot.com. It's also in the book, so I'm going to hold the book up once more if I can, AJ. Of course. I've been linking to it all during this broadcast so people can Good. click and get it. Good. Thank you. And now I'll link to the website. So how many of the things in the book do you do? I know. I remember one time I interviewed you. You were on the treadmill the whole time during the interview. Yeah, so I do. Um, you know, <laughs> people always ask me, do I really get 10,000 steps a day? Well, I have a pedometer here, and I'll show you what I have today. I have 10, eight already. I'll get over 13. Yesterday it was 12, three. The day before 11, three. The day before 13, two. Uh, the day before 14, nine. The day before 24. Uh, the day before 16, four. Wait, how are you getting 16? And the day before 18, three. That, uh, how, what are you doing to get that many steps? Well, well, when I um, when I'm doing research or working in my office, so today I was writing a paper um, with another person. We were doing it via uh, a Teams share, if you will. But I was on the treadmill walking the entire time, so you can walk on the treadmill while you do work. So I have a a uh, treadmill desk at work, um, and at home I've got a treadmill and a bicycle, so I don't watch any TV and I'm a, uh, I'm a Cleveland Cavaliers. That's a basketball team, uh, nut. And so, um, and I also have season tickets to the Browns and the, and 10 games to the Indians. So whenever I'm watching any of those, when they're playing away, it's on a treadmill or on a exercise bike, Schwinn bike, or on a rowing machine, or I'm lifting weights while they're doing it. So, um, I try and be efficient and yes, I am, I am vegan with two exceptions, olive oil and- Olive oil's uh, vegan. Olive oil's vegan. I'm, well, I'm olive oil and uh, salmon. Right. So, so I'm, it's, vegan, it's, it's, I'm vegan without very little, I'm with very little oil except olive oil and salmon. You're so close, but the olive oil actually is vegan. So it's just Essie doesn't like it because of, you know, for what, what he does. But but that we, we would still accept you with the olive oil. Somebody asked if you ever read Jonathan Balcom's book, The Secret Life of Fish, but I figured you probably didn't. I didn't. Yeah, um, I didn't. That's <laughs> correct. <laughs> you know, but I, I do. Uh, I I. Uh, you're so close to one of us. How can we push you over? Because, you know, I live near I live, I live near your friend, Dr. Rosanna Vieira now. She's vegan and she's beautiful. Yes, no, that's correct. She is beautiful. But um, I, uh, I, I must admit, uh, I am, I have almost a salmon burger every lunch uh, weekdays. So they're easy to uh, do. Um, and so, uh, um let me just give, I'm sorry, I didn't mean okay. to have that. No worries. To have that on. Go ahead. When, when you uh, when you say you don't watch any television, I, I don't either, but does that- No, no, I watch, I watch, I don't watch any TV without being on a right. treadmill. Exactly, I do the same thing, but I, I use a spin bike. It's like, that's my treat. Like I get to watch a show if I'm on the bike. Yeah. Yeah, I do the same thing, but yeah. Do you know Dr. Michael Greger? He, he, he's always on. Yes, of course. Yeah, he, yeah, I think he's. He, I think he's writing a book, something about living longer as well. So th this is really fascinating, and I look forward to reading your book and uh, you know seeing what I'm already doing right and what I can do better until this technology is available to the masses. My concern is that sometimes in medicine things don't show up right away. You know, like they can take years for us. Let's, let me give you an example. So and this is from medicine. So um, I. When I was much younger, I had radial keratotomy, and and I did that because I wanted I didn't want to get married in glasses, and I, I have this thing where contact lenses wouldn't stick to my eyes, and I had it, and now I really regret it because now they've showed it's really a horrible thing to have, and there's all kinds of things that they didn't know, you know, forty years ago were going to happen to me now because I had this. Um, well, you still look beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and and uh, the uh, the there is always a delay in medicine, um, but um, I expect that there will be uh, much less of a delay in this. So uh, there's enough push for people to to live younger, longer. Um, that we'll get we're we're getting better because of technology at at speeding things, but 
just think it took 60 years for us to get smoking from about 45% of the population, more in men than women, down to around 10% now. Um, we've, it, it's taken a bunch of time to understand um, the uh, treatments of cardiac disease and getting blood pressure under control, et cetera. But we're getting, we're getting better at, at some of these things. So hopefully uh, we'll progress. And uh, you're obviously one of the, uh, if you will, people leading and gui the guiding lights in the field. So don't stop whatever you do, yeah. Jeff. Well, I'll tell you what, when they get the technology, you go first. I'll wait a few years, and if you're okay, I'll go do it next. <laughs> does that sound good? It, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Well, no, I would love this technology because, you know, like I adore Dr. Esselstyn. He's, you know, he's older than you, and I would love for him to do it and live, you know, 40 more years. So Essie is, uh, I think he's 85 now. I think he might be 88, actually. He's 88. Um, because Ann just turned 80, 80. Yeah, I think he could be 88. I'll, I'll okay. look it up, but I think it was 1935. Yeah, I think he's going to be he 88. Won, as as you know, he won uh, a gold medal in the 56 Olympics. I think it was 56 Olympics um, in rowing, two-man rowing. Um, and uh, he is a idol. You know, he is someone we idolize. Um there's some things he did crazy and causing unforced errors, if you will. He insists on riding his bike outside. When I hired him, I offered to uh, buy two huge fans and two huge 64-inch uh, or bigger TVs for his uh, exercise area and to give him a Schwinn stationary bike or any stationary bike he wanted or any bike he wanted, put it up on stilts so he could ride it. And he insists on still riding outside. Um, and uh, ha he had two major accidents there, and thank God it survived. Um, but unforced error, you know, um, I, I wish he had taken me up on the big fans and the TVs and the stationary bike. Yeah. Do you do your two minutes of jump rope every day? Um, I do it every other day. I don't do it every day. I wow. do jumping when I don't do it. I do 40 jumps, which isn't two minutes, obviously, on the odd days, um, because that's been shown to increase bone density and keep uh, spines lubricated or um, your discs in your spine lubricated, which is a key. Well, I've seen you in person and I see you now and you look great. You look much younger than your age. Have you always cared about health and longevity? Because obviously you've probably been practicing good lifestyle habits for a while. Um, you know, it was actually this, we in medicine didn't know this and weren't taught this in medical school. And so it was actually a patient who challenged me around uh, 1993 that got me to change um, all of my behaviors. I was physically active and I managed stress and I have a you know, I have a sensational wife um, of whatever it is, 49 years, going on 50 years. Um, and that's obviously key in managing stress. So I did two things right from the beginning and I didn't smoke and I, um, but I always sacrificed sleep and I always had too much stress, et cetera. And it wasn't until, and I didn't eat right, you know, um, until a patient challenged me to do the research. And when we started doing the research, in 1993 for real age, I was um, so surprised at how um, strong the data were um, that I changed. Yeah. So yeah, that sleep is really important. I, and the older I get, the less I'm willing to sacrifice it, even to even yes. to exercise is as important as that is. So well, I, I'm I'm really um, a fan of yours, Doctor Boys. And even though you're not quite vegan, you're you're very vegan tolerant, vegan friendly, and you do a lot of great things. And I appreciate you so much. Especially, you know, this is the week of a, a summit that I appear in every uh, year called the Kick Sugar Summit. And you were one of the first, you know, real advocates against sugar. And I appreciate your stance on that and what you've done at the Cleveland and clinic to make people aware that whether you're vegan or not, sugar is not a food. Yeah. So we took, uh, as you know, we took all the sugared uh, beverages and all sugared foods that had added sugar in them out of the, all the vending machines, et cetera. So that's right. We did that. And uh, you obviously encouraged that. So thank you. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I hear, you know, people were not happy with you. 
Um, well, when we took, uh, when we banned smoking, I got three death threat letters handwritten from different mailboxes out of Cleveland. So the FBI said they were real and my office got moved to a place where it was hard to hit me with a rifle shot. When, uh, when uh, those stopped in about three months, when uh, we took sugar beverages out um, and sugared food out, uh, added sugar out, um, I got 75 death threats, but they came by email, all of them. So we know who had sent them. Um, so they were obviously kidding, but uh, the, uh, the, point, the point was uh, most people adopted to it. Um, and as you know, uh, we got threatened from one of the major beverage companies that were gonna take away our subsidy for education that they gave us out of the vending machines. Um, so we switched vendors, if you will, to uh, the different company and uh, um, people start buying uh, water yeah. instead. What what a novel thought to drink the, yeah. the, the, the uh, beverage that is associated with your species history. Well, good for you for not backing down. I always like people that, that are not afraid to, to challenge the status quo. So thank you so much, Dr. Royce. And I wish you every success with the new book, The Great Age Reboot. The link is below and it comes out on the 13th. Oh, great question from Debbie. Will this book be available on Audible? Um, yes, um, so we did record it on both. Uh, I read I read it and uh, Albert Ratner read some of the economic section, so it's going to be available. I don't know, it's supposed to be available by September 13th. I don't know if it will be. It, I saw it wasn't listed on Amazon yet, but I think it will be. Great. Well, that, that's how I'm going to listen to it for sure while I'm Thank on you. my bike or taking a walk. Thanks again, Dr. Royce. And it's always, oh, there was a question I missed from Kathy. Did you write a book with Jim Perko on celiac disease? She said she took a course. I'm so sorry, Kathy. It was uh, while he was talking uh, on, I guess, at the Cleveland Clinic, maybe some kind of culinary course. Yes, we have culinary medicine. Jim Perko is a magnificent chef. The book is called What to Eat When. It's up here i don't know if you can see this what to eat when um and it does have what to do with uh, how to make great food that is celiac friendly um, as well as for a whole bunch of other conditions so there's what to eat when and the what to eat when cookbook and if you go to vimeo.com slash showcase slash in the kitchen um, you see me discussing the science and Jim Perko cooking. Hundred there are one hundred and six different recipes and menus there now. That he uh, they're all about fifteen minutes long, and he is a mag he is he is the most magnificent uh, teacher of culinary medicine I've ever seen. Well, let's get him on the show because he came on once with you and made a chocolate mousse, and I, I I'd love to have him do his own episode. I would he, I will get him there. Yeah, please. Um, someone's saying, I cannot jump rope. Would a rebounder work as well for what you were talking about? No, um, it has to be on a hard surface. So a rebounder doesn't give your, you enough uh, jolt to your bone cells. Okay, great. All right. Yeah, get, get me Jim, Chef Jim. That would be great. Thanks, Dr. Royzen. I hope this is another one of your New York Times bestsellers. Thank you, AJ, and Take you care. will help make it there. Thank right, you. Thank you. If you see any Esselstyns, tell them I said hello. Bye-bye.